Well, he is risen. He is risen Amen. We're so glad to have you, the second service today here at Oxford. And we had a great first service. And we just want to welcome all of you today and those of you who are visiting and those who are online with us today as we celebrate the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And this morning, uh, after our a brief message, uh, we have three people that are going to share their testimonies, how the resurrection power of Jesus Christ has changed them. And uh, we heard a great testimony this morning from Ryan Williams. And uh, if you uh, want to watch it, we'll likely have them up online at some point uh, fairly soon as well. Uh, just a reminder that today, uh, just the JK, SK, and nursery are open, and uh, grades one to five will just stay in the service as well. And just a reminder, we'll go back to a 10 o'clock service uh, next week, all right? I just wanted to be clear about that as well. Let me pray. We'll get into the Word of God, and then we'll have some baptisms. Father, as we pray today, we are just so thankful that we can come and celebrate the one who was raised from the dead for us, that he died on the cross, he was buried, he had shed his blood for our sins, and he was buried, and then, as he promised, he was raised again from the dead so that we can have resurrection life. Father, all of us in this room were created by you. And Father, all of us in this room have a sense that there is something eternal. And so we pray, Father, that you would just bless us, lead us, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. An older man called a life insurance agent and said he wanted to take out some life insurance. Fine, said the agent, but before we make an appointment, I need to ask you a few preliminary questions. Tell me, first of all, how old are you? And the man replied, well, I'm 97 years old, he replied. And the agent said, well, I'm, I'm very sorry, but my company cannot possibly insure you at that age. Hearing this, the old, older man became very annoyed and said to the agent, you know what, you're making a big mistake, he said. If you look carefully at all your statistics, you'll find that very few men like me die after 97 years of age. All of us have this sense of the eternal in our life. We want to live forever, you might say. In Thornton Wilder's play, Our Town, classic play, one of the characters says, everybody knows that something is eternal. And it ain't houses, it ain't names, it ain't the earth, and it ain't even the stars. Everyone knows in their bones that something is eternal. Something that has to do with us human beings. There's something way down deep that's eternal about every human being. Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 11 says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. God has set eternity in the human heart, it says. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. The life of Jesus Christ tells us that God's resurrection power was revealed and is being revealed today in transformed lives. Resurrection Sunday is not only a past event to be memorialized or remembered, but it is an eternal present reality today as all over this earth, there are people worshiping the resurrected Jesus Christ and his coming. See, the words of Jesus 2,000 years ago to Martha and her sister with the death of their brother Lazarus echo to us today. John eleven twenty five, where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a reality in our day and age because we need hope. We need answers to life and its meaning. 
and what we find in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that there is hope, there is life, and that we can have it to the full. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. That's what he said in John 10, verse 10. So instead of lives of quiet desperation, instead of lives of personal isolation, depression, and living without hope, Jesus Christ meets our need to have personal meaning, purpose, and hope for the future because of what Christ has done for us. We just celebrated and remembered Good Friday. And as we've been going through this weekend, we've been reading through the book of Matthew and the account of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. What transformed the followers of Jesus Christ from mourners into worshipers? What transformed the disciples from the hopelessness of death to this assured hope that they proclaimed? What caused them to spread the good news throughout the the Roman Empire and see countless people turn away from sin, repent of sin, and turn to Jesus Christ to transform them? What has made those men and women down through the centuries spread this message of the good news of Jesus right down to us who know Jesus Christ today? It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus was no longer dead but alive. He is is not here as Cameron read for us from Matthew. He is risen. That was the, the joyous proclamation Jesus had predicted and told his disciples before that that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life, Matthew 16, 21. And Joseph's garden tomb was empty on the third day. It was a well-established fact. The guards knew it, and so did the women who were first to discover that Jesus was again resurrected from the dead and Peter and John. The high priest and their colleagues knew it too. Finding it empty, their only recourse was to bribe the guards to fabricate a lie. Nowhere in the writing of the apostles after that, uh, the, the empty tomb was not mentioned. There was no need to mention it, for everyone in Jerusalem knew it was empty. Jesus had risen from the dead. He was no longer there. The tomb was empty. See, the empty tomb stands above all human history to proclaim the death, that death is not the end of life. The resurrection of Jesus promises his disciples, his followers, his children, his eternal family, that resurrection is certain because he was raised from the dead. The empty tomb of Christ speaks clearly to us human beings that the power of death, the wickedness of sin, and our greatest enemy, death and the devil, was overcome when Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. It is this word, resurrection, that moves our hearts so that it can dispel fear about death and bring hope, this hope of eternal life to us through faith in Jesus Christ. The meaning of the empty tomb for us today is real. It was just as real for the women and the men who witnessed the resurrection of Christ. But what does it mean to us today? Well, first of all, that Christ triumphed over the power of death. Death had gained a momentary victory as Jesus was nailed to the cross. But with all its destructive power, it was not powerful enough to hold the Lord of glory in its bonds. Jesus rose from death, came forth physically from the tomb, leaving the empty grave clothes behind. Because Christ overcame the power of death, death no longer has the final word with us who know Jesus Christ. When we live in union or in relationship with Jesus Christ, His resurrection power operates in us so that we too shall be raised from the dead and that we can experience His power over death which can be made available to us because we trust in Him. 
Secondly, Christ triumphed over the power of sin. When he died, the power of evil and sin died with him. When he triumphed over death, he came forth without sin and the evil that was placed upon him where he took your place and my place that he carried to his death. He set it us free. And this assures us that his power is greater than the power of sin and evil and greater than the power of death. His victory was complete and his power is greater than all other heavenly and earthly powers. Christ rose and is alive. He rose bodily, not subject to the limitations of our earthly bodies and not subject to disease, decay, or death. Christ is there as the prototype of resurrected humanity. He was the first among all who believed in him. As Jesus came alive with this new immortal body no longer subject to its limitations and suffering, so also we can receive an immortal body. We will be changed. You see this in this extensive passage in 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul in the first few verses lays out the gospel very clearly that Christ died for us, paid the penalty of all of our sin, that he was buried, and that he rose again. But throughout that passage, and I encourage you to read 1 Corinthians 15 in its entirety, it shows that when we know Jesus Christ, we too will be changed so that we can dwell with him forever. Because he rose from the dead, we have a living hope of victory over death and we are given eternal life because of his resurrection. And eternal life begins the moment we trust in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation. Worldly religions do not have the resurrection to their teachings. And even today, we have many people that are believing, well, it's Jesus plus this, plus rituals, plus this, plus this, and even baptism uh, that saves us. It doesn't. We must come to faith in Jesus Christ alone. Christ triumphed over the power of death and sin with the resurrection to save us. But what is our response? I mean, we go through another Easter, maybe, and and we kind of go through it and we kind of have an aspect of what happens, but Jesus always called people to commit their lives to him, to repent of their sin, to believe in him, and allow him to save them. See, there is nothing that we can do to save ourselves. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. We can try to be a good person. We can try to use religious rituals and other things to try to save us. But Jesus calls us to trust in him by faith alone. That nothing we can bring to him will save us. Some of you look pretty good, but your good looks are not going to save you. Some of you are doing some good things, but those good things don't save you. You might even look across the room and say, you know what, I'm a lot better than that person over there than what they're doing. But comparison just shows you you need Jesus. How's that? Because if you're comparing yourself to someone else, you're in trouble. You need Jesus. And so in Romans chapter 10, it just says here in verse 9, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. All scripture says anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Notice there's not anything there about a denomination. It doesn't say anything there about being religious. It says what you do with Jesus Christ will determine your eternal destiny. Whether you will spend eternity 
with God or separated from God in hell. You need to trust Jesus Christ to make sure that you have this relationship. Paul preaches the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 8. He says, what I received I passed on to you as first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Peter and then to the twelve, and after that He appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most whom are still living at the writing of that, those verses, though some have fallen to sleep. See, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the good news that transforms lives. Paul wrote in Second Thess- or Second, um, in First Corinthians rather, Second Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things are gone. Behold, all things become new. We just sang a song that we can lay all of our addictions and problems at the foot of the cross. And some of you maybe here today are thinking, well, what I've done in my past, there's no way that God can forgive it. But that's what the cross does. Christ's cross forgives all of our sin. You might be here today and think, well, you're better than anybody else. Well, guess what? You have been boasting in yourself for too long. You need to surrender to Jesus Christ. Because your boasting will not get you into a right relationship with God. God's gospel humbles us to help us understand that Jesus died in our place. Took upon himself all of our sin. All of our pride. All of the arrogance. So that we can humbly come before him and be transformed to be one of his children. It was the start of the holiday season years ago. A long weekend. And in those days, I remember them, I've lived long enough, where people would get gas and go to a service station where they actually serve it, served you. Remember those, remember those days? I think we have one place like that in Woodstock still. And there was a long lineup, people waiting, people trying to get out of town. And, and finally, uh, a man in his car, he was actually the local pastor, comes up and the attendant says, well, pastor, I'm so sorry about the big delay today. And, uh, but it seems like everybody waits until the last minute, minute to get ready for a trip which they knew they were going to take all along. Pastor smiled and said, I know what you mean. I got the same problem in my business too. So many of us are going through life just kind of thinking that maybe at the end of life or Maybe next year or next month I'll get right with God. Please do not delay in responding to the good news of Jesus Christ. Our eternal destiny it is determined by what we do with Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. What have you done with Jesus Christ? I mean, Jesus is very clear that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes unto the Father except through him. It will not be your parents that save you. It will not be your grandparents that save you because of their faith or some friend or someone else. It has to be you coming to Christ and believing in him. What have you done with Jesus? The message of Jesus is still the same as it was 2,000 years ago. Come, follow me. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. And the king of the kingdom is Jesus Christ. I love what Paul says as we kind of finish up the message today. In 1 Corinthians 15, 55 to 57. I I get to read this often at the graveside of believers who know Jesus Christ. And we, we just talk about this very openly. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not talking here about religion. I'm not talking here about being part of a certain church. I'm talking here about Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us. 
He was buried in a tomb and he kept his promise by being resurrected from the dead. He is coming again. And we are to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And, the, and as a result of that, you can be saved. He died for you. He died for me. He lives again. He lives for you. And so we will serve him and follow him. That's our only response. Amen. See, you, you and I do not know yet what we are capable when we're doing the will of God and living in the power of God because Christ has saved us. Some of you need to believe in Jesus today. Some of you need to be transformed by Christ. Your direction is leading to destruction and death, not life. And believers, as they trust Jesus Christ, one of the things we see very clearly in Scripture is that people believe in Christ, then there are, they are baptized. That means that they go public with their faith. Baptism does not save us. Baptism is a public stand for Jesus. Public stand for Jesus. And, and so today there are three in this service that are taking a public stand for Jesus. Water baptism. And, and it's, a, it's just a powerful symbol of the resurrection of Christ and what Christ can do in a life. Paul talks about in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus loves you. He died for you. He lives for you. And the symbol of baptism is really the symbol of what Christ has done in somebody's life. We die to self. We go down into the water. We're dead to ourself, we're dead to our works, we're dead to our, to our religion, and we are then raised in, in Christ. Christ transforms us. Jesus shows us the resurrection power of life through his Holy Spirit. And Jesus in Mark 1, 9 to 13, it talks about Jesus' baptism. Jesus is always our example in everything that's truly spiritual and godly. And it says at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. At once the spirit sent him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and angels attended him. The amazing thing about Jesus' example about baptism is that he didn't need to be baptized because he is God's son. But he uses it as an example to show that more than ever, you and I need to live in the resurrection power of God by the Holy Spirit of God. And that Jesus, as he was baptized, was blessed by God too. But notice something else about this. In order for us to deal with the temptations of life, we really need to be obedient to Christ. And when we are obedient to Jesus Christ, when we've trusted him, then we are to live for him in obedience by the power of the Spirit of God. And we can go into a wilderness for 40 days and be tempted, but God uses his power in our life so that we can live holy and pleasing lives to him. And so each one who's taking a stand today is proclaiming the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and they are taking a stand for him that no matter what happens the rest of this life, they will live for Christ receiving his blessings his direction and his power to live a life that is full of the power of God let me pray father as we pray today there might be those this morning that need you they've been living lives without you 
They may have fallen into religion, but they do not have a relationship with you. Father, your word to them, just like those who are being baptized today, is come follow me. Father, we are thankful for the three that are taking a stand for you today. We thank you for Candace. We thank you for Tom, and we thank you for Jack. And as they share their testimonies today, taking a stand for you, may it not only encourage us believers in Christ to continue on, but may your Holy Spirit speak to people today of their need to get right with you and allow you to be the Lord and Savior of their life. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.